Good morning. It is good to see everyone today. Those of you in the room, we're glad you're here. If you're in the family room with maybe your littles, we're glad you're joining with us today as well. And all the cool people, it seems like, are in the lakeside room this morning. So we're glad you're there as well. Andy Nelson, I see you, and we're glad to see you up and around. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to everyone joining us in the room. Uh, we're going to continue today in the series we launched last week. My name is Jack Guerra. I'm one of the pastors here at Spring Lake. And last week here in Bellevue, Ryan started our study of the letter in the scriptures known as 1 John uh, that uh, we're going to be looking at it for these next couple of weeks. If you missed last week's message, I would encourage you to go back and catch up with it, catch up on it, because Ryan did a great job of bringing some history and culture and context to the letter. So that was last week's that got us started, and he also laid out a, uh, a challenge and a reminder as we started this book, the challenge, first of all, was to read 1 John this week. Now, some of you are darting your eyes everywhere like I did in middle school when I didn't do my homework. How many of you read 1 John sometime this week? Did, did, okay, some of you did, great. Here's what I wanna challenge you to. Read 1 John this week. It's 100 verses. It is a little bit longer than a Reddit article. Okay, you're gonna talk about about three to four pages of the New Testament of a, of, in your Bible. Uh, I would encourage you, get in there and read it so it's more than just one hour on a Sunday. It's something that will take root throughout the week. So we'll ask you again next week. Hopefully a few more hands go up. Read First John sometime this week. And I would encourage you throughout this series, just jump in and read it so that it becomes a part of you and not just something you catch some ideas off of when you read it once in a blue moon. The second thing I wanna remind you of, the reminder is that this book is not written like many of the New Testament books or letters in the Bible. It is not historical in context like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is not as systematic and logical or in structure as Paul's writings are where he uh, approaches things in a logical and thematic format. John is far more topical. While he writes a letter, he is making sure to hit topics that are pertinent to the people that are uh, in the church, as well as, honestly, to us today. So as we go through this series, we're not going to be going from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3. We're going to be dealing with the topics that John wants to make sure we cover in 1 John. Now, today's topic is a fun one. Today we get to talk about sin and forgiveness. Sin and forgiveness. First, looking at this word sin in the Greek, which this was written in, it's amartia, which means to transgress. And you say, where do you get the word sin from the word amartia? The word sin actually was originally spelled S-Y-N. It's an English word. And it means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. So when we talk about sinning, we're talking about missing the mark. Now, we're going to talk about forgiveness a little bit later in the message, but forgiveness is to pardon. It's a remission, and you'll hear more about that in a moment. But when we talk about especially sin, it seems like there's two extreme camps that people will get trapped into or fall into. My mom's side of the family growing up was what they called old school holiness movement. And they had a philosophy of, if you're grinning, you're sinning. If you're having any kind of fun, you must be sinning. If you're enjoying what you're doing, it must be wrong. If you are relaxed in any way, shape, or form, mm, you're sinning. I mean, anything could be taken as a sin. And some of you are going, no, that's kind of extreme. Case in point, my grandfather one time was working outside. I had a decent-sized piece of property in Canada, was building a dam by a little pond he had, and he had a T-shirt on and, and a top shirt. He took the top shirt off, was working in his T-shirt. A neighbor lady drove by. My grandfather went inside and prayed that he did not sin by causing her to sin by seeing him in a T-shirt. <laughs> and he lived with the tension of that for a while. My mom told me growing up, it was literally like, you want one more cookie? Aren't we close to the line of gluttony? I, there was no sense of grace or peace or mercy. Everything was like right on the edge of the cliff and ready to go over. Here's a second camp, though, which is kind of the pendulum swing to the other side. And it's basically saying that nothing shy of murder is a sin. Basically, go do what you want to do. If it feels good, do it. Knock yourself out. 
If it stops feeling good, then don't do it. God knows you're human. He wouldn't have put it in front of you. He wouldn't have put them in front of you in your life if you weren't meant to enjoy it. Besides, I mean, haven't we moved on from this idea of moral absolutes? Aren't those just superstitious ideas so that people can control you? Have you living in fear? We say that and we watch a culture kind of shift that way. And at the same time, that same culture is dealing with guilt, depression, and anxiety at record levels. Sin is a real deal. We need to talk about it, but we have to understand the context. Now, here's the problem with both of those concepts. Both of them are outside in thinking. Outside in. That holiness group was, if I look right, if my haircut's right, if I talk right, if I act right, it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside. It's what it looks like on the outside. Therefore, I must be okay. Or I must not be okay. The other side of that is, you know what, if it feels good on the outside, then it must be okay on the inside. Outside in thinking. John is going to give us a different perspective. He starts from inside out thinking. Where is our heart with God? What's our motivation behind what we're doing or not doing? Now, I want to set a tone also early on this one because some of you come in with the mindset, you hear me say sin, and you're thinking already, if he doesn't deal with this issue, then he's compromising. And then there are some others in the room who are saying, if he does deal with this issue, I'm out of here. I am not handing out a list of sins today. There is no 10-page document that's under your seat saying a list of sins in chronological order from worst to best to best. Best. Is there a best sin? I don't know. But it's not like you've got a checklist. You know, well, parking ticket, that's on the lower level of sin. Being mean to kids, you know, that's a pretty bad sin. Bears fan, that's like way over here. (laughs) We're not going to go through checklists of sin. What I want to do is look at what does John have to say truly about sin and forgiveness. I see three really clear messages in regard to sin and forgiveness throughout this letter from, in 1 John. And here's the first one. Here's the first thing in regard to sin. Ready? We've all done it. Every one of us in this room, anyone who's watching in another room, the person standing in front of you, we've all done it. We have all sinned. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Now the passages, because we're going to be hopping around the book, you're free to follow along in, in your Bibles or in your mobile devices. The scriptures will be on the screen. They're also on the app. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can follow through the points as well there. But 1 John 1, 5 um, through verse 8. It says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Pause right here. If we, who's John saying has sinned? We. John's including himself. If we claim to be without sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Nobody is off that list. The most holy person that you know, the people you think are like this far from just floating because they are so close to God, they've sinned. We all have. Romans tells us all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. But there's good news. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Verse nine, can we put that one back on the screen? Could you all read this with me, please? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now this word confess, that's up there. This isn't just stating your sin out loud. Just because you say it doesn't really change anything if on the inside nothing has changed from our heart. As a matter of fact, I know some people who confess their sins bragging. They're actually pretty proud of the sin 
that they've committed. But this word confess, there's another word that we use, and it's this other word is repent. And repent means to turn from it. If we confess it, if we turn from it, we have no intention of going back to it. If we confess, if we repent of our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's read it together one more time. Ready? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you think you haven't sinned, if you think I is a little boo-boo, no, we've all sinned. We've all missed the mark, but we all have forgiveness available to us. And that's the second point. point. When, not if, when we do sin, we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. First John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, please realize this is not a license to go do what you want to do because it's going to get forgiven anyway. What's the old statement? It's easier to ask forgiveness than ask permission. This isn't that. What it is is a realization that we have been blessed. Remember, we just read it. We've all sinned, but when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of them. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Pause right there. Here's a word we don't use very often. Atoning. To atone. The word in Greek, once again, the original language is to cover, to expiate, to cancel, to make atonement, to cleanse, to disannul, to forgive, to be merciful, to, uh, to pardon, to purge away to put off, to make reconciliation. This is what Jesus did for us. This passage says that his son was the atoning sacrifice. His blood, what he did on the cross, what we should have been penalized for, for our sin, already established, we got it. Jesus was the atonement. He was the payment. He was the sacrifice for that sin. Verse 11 says, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So Christ's blood covers our sins, pays the penalty for sin. He's the payment to make us right with God. Our punishment was on him. Now remember this. I want you to hold on to this because some of you deal heavily with not only guilt but condemnation. Jesus already paid the penalty for a sin. Jesus paid the penalty for the crime. And if the penalty has been paid, when it is forgiven, there's no second penalty. Some of you are waiting for God to drop the hammer on you for something you did 37 years ago. Jesus already paid the price for that. There will be no second penalty because the penalty was paid. The crime has been covered. Here's the way I remember this word atonement. It's the atonement that makes us at one with God. It's the atonement that makes us at one, makes us right, makes us one with God. Christ made it possible for the stain of our sin to be purged, to be washed off, to be covered. Have you ever put anything on your counter? For me, it's grape juice. I don't know why. But you put grape juice on your counter, and of course, you got the perfect ring where your cup was. And if you have any kind of white countertop, you, you get the sponge. You don't put anything on it. You kind of rub it. Nothing happens. I'll try this stuff called soap, you know, just to wash it down a little bit. Nothing happens. You get an astringent. Nothing happens. You bleach the thing, and finally it starts to fade. When you look at the sin in our life, it's there. And you can't just grab a rag and wipe it off. You can't just hope it goes away. It's the blood of Christ that Scripture says washes our sins clean. It's how we're at one. We're forgiven. We're right with God. Why in the world would Jesus do this? Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were in rebellion, while we were hated him, Christ died for us. 
Well, I didn't hate God. Were you a little numb to him? Maybe apathetic? In that state, Christ died for us. God did this out of love. And if he does this out of love for us, guess what that means? Verse 11 tells us, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We've been forgiven. Now we must forgive others. Forgiveness isn't just something we receive. It's something we give. It doesn't mean you put yourself back in front of the runaway car of that person's life but you also don't hold on to the heartache and the pain and the anger that they may have caused you. We forgive, we release it. Is it always easy? Absolutely not. But just as we've been forgiven, we've been covered the atonement by Christ's blood, we are to forgive others as well. Sin and forgiveness, how we live it toward God and toward others shows us something about ourselves. And this is the third point. How you live shows who you live for. How you live shows who you live for. Repentance, forgiveness, and love. These show at the root of our heart who we're living for. First John chapter three, beginning at verse four. It says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, Sin is lawlessness. What is sin? Lawlessness. It's we're breaking God's law. Verse five. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Here was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to and sister. First John chapter 4 and verse 10, we read it earlier. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, unwittingly or at least not deliberately these were sins which a man might commit in ignorance or when he was swept away by some overmastering impulse 
or in some moment of strong emotion when his passions were too strong for the leash of, the, of his will to hold him. With this sin, there is repentance and there is forgiveness. This is not a sin that ends in death. Why? Because we've asked for forgiveness for it. What happens to that sin? It's already been paid for by Jesus. Let me read on. On the other hand, there were sins of the high hand and of a haughty heart. The sins which a man deliberately committed, the sins in which he defiantly took his own way in spite of knowing the will of God for him. It was the first kind of sin that the sacrifice atoned. But for the sins of the haughty heart and high hand, no sacrifice can atone. There's no repentance. There's no forgiveness. There's no atonement. There's no washing of the sin. Person goes on to say, it is the experience of every person that the first time that they do a wrong thing, they do it with shrinking and fear. And after they have done it, they feel grief and remorse and regret. But if they allow themselves again and again to flirt with temptation and to fall, on each occasion, the sin becomes easier and easier. Don't raise your hands, but can anyone else kind of relate to this? The thing that started off sneaky that you just kind of get used to doing? It says, if they, th uh, if they think they escape the consequences, they think they escape the consequences on each occasion, the self-disgust and remorse and regret become less and less. And in the end, they reach a state when they can sin without a tremor. It is precisely that which is the sin which is leading to death. So long as a person in their heart of heart hates sin and hates themselves for sinning, so long as they know they are sinning, they are never beyond repentance and therefore never beyond forgiveness. But once they begin to revel in sin and to take it to a deliberate place in their life, they are on the way to death. For they are on uh, the way to a state where the idea of repentance will not and cannot enter their head. There's two paths to take with our sin, repentance and forgiveness. Or we just bathe in it, stay there, live with it, and there's no forgiveness. I kind of look at it like a house fire. Your fire may start in your house, in your living room. It may start with uh, you know, a spark that leaves your fireplace and hits the pillow on the couch and the pillow catches fire. And you see it and you think, hmm, fire in my house. What should I do about this? You watch the fire go from the pillow to the couch, from the couch to the drapes, from the drapes to the walls and your wood floors. At what point do you put the fire out or do you just wait till it's all burned down? The challenge that John has is when you start sinning, when the pillow catches fire, put it out. Repent, ask for forgiveness, and know that it's been atoned, it's been paid for. Chapter three and verse six says, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse five, chapter five, verse 18 again, it says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin, you may have sinned, you repent, you turn from it, but you don't continue in it. The one who was born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. John draws three things, three statements at the end of this chapter that I think as, as Jesus followers, we need to remember. First of all, the Christian is emancipated or cut loose from the power of sin. Is the temptation of sin there? Absolutely. Absolutely but the chains of it don't have to hold us back. It has been paid for. We can be freed from the punishment of sin. Secondly, the Christian is on the side of God against the world. When there is a line and we're trying to please God and we're trying to please ourselves, we're trying to straddle this line and we start lying to ourselves. Well, God will be okay with it. You know, times change. He knows who I am. He knows where I'm weak. As Jesus followers, we have a responsibility to be on the side of God. And if you find yourself trying to manipulate the situation or lie to yourself to cover it, it'll be okay later. I'm sure it's not that bad. You're putting yourself in a hole. Don't play with the matches. 
And thirdly, the Christian is conscious that they have entered into the reality which is God. Our thoughts, our hearts, our minds, John writes about it throughout the letter, is to be walking in the light and staying out of the darkness. The darkness will call, join the dark side. We have cookies. It's gonna try and pull you in. But we're to walk in Christ. We're to walk in the light. And I want to give you a personal illustration that I hope helps us back out and stop seeing the myopic view of sin of, oh, that's a bad one, that's a, that's a good thing. That's a, and we can get so locked up. And, I, and I'm sorry to use another illustration from this, but this is, for my family right now, for Gene and I, this is not only our reality, but what God's teaching us in this. For those of you who don't know, I used an illustration a couple of weeks ago. I realized some people don't know what's going on. My wife is battling breast cancer. A year ago this month, she had a lumpectomy. They told her, congratulations, it's all gone. Go enjoy life until about four months later. And they said it was back. And a couple months after that, back pretty heavy. And we're in a hospital and the, the emergency room and the, the news had been given to us and it was devastating. Because this wasn't just about, oh, we're gonna have to change our summer plans. This was life and death. And it was presented with one option, unfortunately, being more likely than the other. Doctor leaves the room. We're both bawling. She's in quite a bit of pain. They have her on a pain medication. And as we're talking, I told her, and she said the same thing. She said, I'm not afraid to die. And I said, I'm not afraid of you dying. I don't want you going on the next bus load. And I hate the idea of the process of getting there, but I'm, I'm not afraid of you dying. Because I know where you're going. And she was drugged up. She was sedated pretty good, and she looks at me and goes, well, you're going there too. <laughs> and it's not because of our checklist of sins and not sins. It's not because we remember to say, God, forgive us for these, but not for these. It's because our heart is to be right with the Lord. And it's more than just about, did I get this right and did I get this wrong? I've got a God who loved me. We have a king who has been so gracious to us. Why would I want to do anything in rebellion against him? The God whose scripture says goes through the valley of the shadow of death with us. Why would I want to do anything that would hurt his heart. I don't want to hurt my wife's heart. I don't want to break relationship with anyone in this room. Why would I want to do something to break relationship with my God for eternity? Don't look at sin as am I doing good enough or am I doing bad enough? Am I right with the Lord who loves you and paid the price for you? We should never look at the cross the same again. We should never take communion the same again when we remember that the atonement is all because of Jesus, not us. I'm so grateful for eternal life and for what God has done for us. Do I still sin? Yes. My pride, my anger, fear and anxiety. Things where I said, God, I, I don't know that I can trust you with this. I'm taking this one back. But I also know not out of a checklist, but out of a relationship, the place where I need to go to him and say, I'm sorry, I screwed this up enough, here it's yours. I'm asking you to look at sin and forgiveness in a new way, not as a checklist, but as how our relationship is with our good and loving king. Maybe you're here today, and I wanna loop this back with three closing questions. Number one, you may be saying, what is sin? I would say, go to scripture, first of all, Look at what the Bible says. Get to know it. That's why we want you reading 1 John this week. That's why we want you reading the Bible. If you have questions, maybe you've got something going on in your life and you're not sure, you haven't been raised with this kind of language, I'd love to talk to you in the lobby afterwards or you can email me, find any one of our, our staff or the prayer people after service. We'd love to talk to you about what that is. Secondly, as I said earlier, if you're trying to manipulate God into being okay with what you're doing, please stop. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to him. What's God's heart for this situation? And thirdly, finally, 
I'm asking you to view sin and forgiveness, not from a right and wrong list, but through the eyes of God who loves you and wants a right relationship with you. Two more scriptures in closing. They'll be on the screen. I'd like us to read them together. The first one is the heavy part of the passage. Uh, Romans chapter three, verse 23. Can we read this? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. Next passage, Romans uh, 6, 23. Can we read it? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God for Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Maybe you're here today and you've never had that relationship with Christ. You've not known his forgiveness. You've, you know what Christmas and Easter services are about. You understand maybe this picture of right and wrong, but a relationship with Jesus. Asking for his forgiveness from those things that have been a wall between you and him. Maybe it's a sin that you've been involved with. Well, I'm not in any sexual sin. I've never stolen from anybody. Okay, great, but what are we doing that's a wall between us and him? If you're here today and you've never begun that relationship with Christ, you say, today's the day. I'd love you to just raise your hand. I'd love to pray with you this morning, right where you're seated, to make things right between the two of you. Okay, thanks. Maybe you're here today and you've got something in your life that you know is a wall in the relationship. You, you love Jesus, but boy, you keep this thing in your back pocket. You want a closer relationship with him, but are you ready to do it at the expense of this sin, this thing that's separating you? If you've got that wall, something between you and the Lord this morning, and it's time to bring it to him, it's time to get this thing out of the way. This is a moment where the rubber hits the road. Would you just raise your hand up and I wanna pray for us in just a moment. Thanks, thank you, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm gonna be quiet for just a moment and I want you to bring that thing to, to Jesus because the Holy Spirit is here and he's listening. And this is a time for repentance and making things right between yourself and him because the atonement has been paid and we can be one with him. Would you just talk to the Lord right now as if he's sitting right there beside you because he's with you he won't leave you or forsake you. And let's make these things right. Lord, I thank you for forgiveness in my own life. I thank you that the blood of Christ washes away my sin. I thank you that when I walk in fear and doubt and anxiety or anger, Lord, it doesn't mean you run away from me. You continue to walk with me. I thank you, Lord, that I can turn to you and ask for forgiveness, and it's there. And the scripture says, the peace that passes all understanding will guard my heart, my mind, in Christ Jesus. I pray for those in the room, Lord God, whatever it is that may be their wall, that may be boxing them in, limiting that relationship with you. Maybe it's a religious spirit, maybe it's a judgmental attitude, maybe it is something sexual or or a wrong done against someone else, Lord, we lay it at your feet and we thank you that you died for it. And because you died for it, we don't have to. We ask for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace. In Christ's name we pray.